We'll have brief presentations from our participants, and then we'll open up for questions starting here at NASA headquarters and go to our phone lines across the country and across from the world. Social media is a buzz with Mars and the MAVEN mission. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, follow the conversation. Send those questions in to hashtag Ask NASA. We'll get to some of your questions on social media, and we're also following this presentation. We'll have an hour-long session and perhaps longer to send in your questions and have some of the scientists answer your questions from all over the world. Hashtag Ask NASA. And of course, you'll be able to follow all of this information and much, much more on the web at www.nasa.gov slash maven and to journey to Mars, www.nasa.gov slash journey to Mars. Before we get started, let me introduce you to our folks here and also joining us from Iowa and Colorado. First, Michael Meyer, lead scientist, Mars Exploration Program, NASA headquarters. Bruce Jakoski, MAVEN Principal Investigator at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, LASP, at the University of Colorado Boulder. And joining us from Iowa City, Jasper Helicus, the MAVEN Solar Wind Ion Analyzer Instrument Lead from the University of Iowa. And over at Colorado, Yasue Dong, MAVEN Science Team member at LASP, and Dave Brain, also at LASP, MAVEN co-investigator. So hold on to your hats and let's get started, and I'll toss it over to Michael. Well, thanks, Dwayne. The NASA Mars Exploration Program has been focused on finding water. Water is the prime ingredient needed for life. It is a major factor in the climate and shaping geology and is a critical resource for future human exploration. We have visual and mineral evidence of water on Mars from orbit. We have rovers that have found rocks that formed in aqueous environments. And we've even found evidence that ancient Mars had enough water to support microbial life. So we've looked for water and we found it. But if you look at Mars today, it's a cold, dry, desert planet. What happened? Mars lost its atmosphere. Well, how did that happen? The atmosphere of Mars could have frozen out. It could have been turned into rocks. It could have been knocked off by asteroids or comets. Or it could have been stripped from the planet by the solar wind. To answer this question, NASA has sent the MAVEN mission to Mars. That mission was designed to look at the upper atmospheric processes, see the interaction with the solar wind, and basically get a better handle on atmospheric loss. So what happened? So we are looking at a mission that is nearing its, completing its prime. It has been under budget, it's been on time, and it's behaving beautifully. So to answer the question, what happened to the Mars atmosphere? I'll quote Bob Dylan. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. So, and to give us some more detail, I'll turn the mic over to the principal investigator of the MAVEN mission, Bruce Jakoski. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the MAVEN spacecraft has been orbiting Mars since September of 2014. We're coming up on the end of the one-year primary mission. Uh, the, the mission lasts for another 10 days, actually, and we'll be getting will be beginning an extended mission after that. The spacecraft and all of the science instruments are working well, and we're here to tell you today about some of the results that have come out from the first six months or so of data analysis. It's taken a long time to get to this stage because the type of instruments we have on MAVEN are not instruments that can instantly be interpreted. They require analysis and calibration in order to be sure that we understand what's coming out of that. Uh, so it's taken a while to get here, but we have results that we think are exciting. We're going to talk about the history of climate on Mars. Uh, MAVEN was designed to understand the changes in climate. If we can roll the first video, please. Uh, today's planet is a cold, dry 
desert-like environment. The atmosphere is thin. It's not capable of sustaining liquid water at the surface today. It would either freeze or evaporate very quickly. However, when we look at ancient Mars, we see a different type of surface, one that had uh, valleys that looked like they were carved by water, lakes uh, that were standing for long periods of time. We see an environment that was much more able to support liquid water. The climate must have been very different, warmer and wetter, and the atmosphere must have been thicker at that time in order to sustain a warmer climate. So what happened to the carbon dioxide from that early atmosphere? What happened to the water from early Mars? MAVEN is exploring the ability of the atmospheric gases to go to the top of the atmosphere where they can be stripped away by the solar wind and by the sun to space. We're studying the top of the atmosphere because that's the conduit, if you will, through which the gas has to travel to go from the main part of the atmosphere to where it can get removed to space. We're going to look at a lot of different processes that can take place in removing the atmosphere. But we're going to focus largely on the, today, on the ability of the solar wind to strip the gas away. If we can roll the second video, please. We're looking at the solar wind as it impinges on the planet. The solar wind is streaming out from the sun at about a million miles an hour and is able to grab ions from the planet and strip them away from the planet or knock them into the planet at very high speed and knock other stuff off. We're going to be talking today about the role of the solar wind in stripping the atmosphere, and we'll be hearing about the behavior of the solar wind and the consequences of loss to space. Dwayne? Thank you, Bruce. And let's get into more of those details. Let's go to the University of Iowa in Iowa City and Jasper Halicus. Jasper? Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, so I'd like to first set the stage by describing a little bit about how Mars interacts with its environment. Uh, if I could have my first graphic, please. Uh, Mars has something in common with the Earth and the other planets, and that, of course, is the influence of the Sun. As you see in both of these graphics, all of the planets, uh, Mars and Earth and the others included, are uh, impinged upon by this flow of charged particles from the Sun that we call the solar wind. Uh, these charged particles stream out from the sun at about a million miles an hour, and they impact all of the planets in our solar system. Now, the Earth and Mars have something that is very different, however. As you see on the right panel of this graphic, the Earth has a strong global magnetic field, and that magnetic field largely shields its atmosphere from the direct impact of the solar wind. Uh, on the left, on the other hand, Mars has no such global magnetic field, and its upper atmosphere lies completely exposed to the solar wind. As a result, the solar wind can interact with that upper atmosphere and strip portions of it away into space. Now, Mars has only a thin atmosphere today and compared to the Earth, say, or Venus, uh, but it's still thick enough to stop the solar wind from hitting the surface of Mars. Instead, the solar wind is deflected around the planet. Uh, and I'm about to show you a, uh, a movie which shows this. If I could have my second graphic, please. Uh, the movie that you're about to see shows the uh, trajectories of the solar wind as they pass by Mars. Uh, the solar wind will be coming in from right to left, and you see that it's deflected around Mars in a, uh, a conical shape. Now, you might notice that that shape is very reminiscent of the shock wave in front of a supersonic jet plane, and that is no accident at all. Uh, it's exactly the same kind of a shock wave that's formed. Now, behind the simulated solar wind trajectories here, you're seeing actual MAVEN data taken from the first year of our mission at Mars. Uh, the colors there are showing the density of the solar wind plasma, the number of charged particles uh, from the solar wind, and the little vectors show the direction that that solar wind is flowing. Uh, this data shows exactly what you just saw in the simulated solar wind, which is that the uh, solar wind comes in, it is shocked, you see the density jump up from blue to red there, and it is deflected around Mars. But that solar wind flow continues in past that outer boundary, and continues into the inner edge of that red region that you just saw on the graphic. And it's at that point where the rubber hits the road. There's a, uh, there's a second boundary there where the solar wind interacts directly with the upper atmosphere. This is unlike anything that we have at Earth. Now, as a result of the uh, magnetic and electric fields that are carried with that solar wind flow, ions which are born in the atmosphere of Mars can be accelerated up to escape velocity and beyond. And we believe this is an important process by which the Mars atmosphere is lost today. Now, this whole interaction picture changes as a function of how hard the solar wind is blowing. If the solar wind is just a gentle breeze, then this interaction picture expands. 
puffs outward. If the solar winds is a strong gale force wind, then this whole picture is compressed downward towards the surface. Uh, a natural question you might ask is, well, what does that do to the loss rate of atmosphere from Mars? Well, we've, uh, we've conducted an experiment to try and answer that, or rather nature has conducted the wonderful experiment for us. If I could have my third graphic, what the sun has done for us uh, is launched a dense bubble of extremely energetic uh, charged particles outwards. Uh, in this third graphic, which you'll see in a second, the uh, charged particles from the sun stream outward uh, at double their normal velocity. Instead of the normal one million miles an hour, uh, this bubble uh, jets out from the sun at two million miles an hour, carrying a tremendous amount of energy. As it plows through the matter in front of it, it develops its own shock wave. So what you might imagine now is that you have two jet planes, each with their own supersonic shock wave, uh, approaching each other. But one of them is thousands, tens of thousands bigger than the other one. If you actually did this, uh, things wouldn't go where, well for the small plane. Um, Mars, which is the small plane in this analogy, is a little bit more robust. But it's very strongly impacted by the energy that's delivered by this event. Uh, it compresses the magnetosphere of Mars, the protected region around the planet, down to about two-thirds of its normal size. And as a result, more of the atmosphere is exposed to these fields that strip away particles from the atmosphere of Mars. In fact, we see that the atmospheric loss rate during this event goes up by a factor of between 10 and 20. So it has an enormous impact on the upper atmosphere of Mars. Uh, now I'm going to throw it over to Yashui Dong, the University of Colorado, and she's going to tell you about some of the processes and the channels by which these charged particles are actually lost to space. Thank you, Jasper. Uh, so Jasper has talked about the solar wind interaction with the Martian atmosphere. Uh, next, we are going to talk about the consequence of this interaction, uh, the ionscape from Mars. And can I have the video, please? So first, we will show a simulation video. We are looking at the solar wind hits the Martian atmosphere, and it also carries a magnetic field with it. The moving magnetic field will generate an electric field uh, in the upper direction in this video. And this will cause the uh, planetary ions to move and escape from Mars. Uh, some ions are very uh, are accelerated by this electric field very quickly. As you can see, that they form this upward plume from the day side of Mars, which looks like a fountain uh, from the top of the Mars. Uh, meanwhile, some other ions will drift around Mars and eventually escape in the solar wind direction, and they will form this tail behind Mars in the night side. And the MAVEN spacecraft is able to uh, measure the ion compositions and the velocities. And here shows the MAVEN measurements of the escaping oxygen ions from Mars. Uh, these arrows represent the measured ion moving directions. As you can see that the data we have here matches the um, simulation results very well. And can I have the next graphic, please? So next, we are going to take a closer look at the MAVEN data. So from the data tab, we can uh, clearly identify three ion populations by their different regions and the moving directions. Uh, first, in the upper hemisphere in this figure uh, are the plume ions uh, moving in the electric field direction. And the red and yellow colors in this region uh, mean that uh, there are many ions escaping through the plume. Um, and uh, such a substantial plume of escaping ions from Mars has never been conclusively identified from previous observations. So MAVEN actually provided the first observational support for the plume as a major uh, feature of the Martian atmosphere. And second, if you look at uh, the night side of Mars in this figure, uh, there are also many ions escaping in the tailward, which is also the solar wind direction. And the other thing you can tell is that uh, the plume ion velocities are significantly higher than the tailward escaping ion velocities, as shown by these uh, longer arrows in the plume region. And third, in the lower hemisphere of this figure, there are ions coming toward Mars. Uh, these ions are generated from the very tenuous neutral corona. The neutral corona is the extended part of the Martian atmosphere, and these ions are moving toward Mars as uh, carried by the upstream solar wind. And from the different colors in this map, we can tell that uh, most of the ions are escaping through the plume and the tail. So the plume and the tail are the two major escaping channels for planetary ions at Mars. 
And uh, um, can I have the next graphic, please? So based on all these observations, we can estimate the two plume to uh, contribute about 25% to the total landscape and the tail to contribute about 75%. And this is the first time that we can confirm from observations that the plume uh, is an important planetary landscape channel from Mars. And also the first time we can quantitatively uh, estimate the contribution from the plume to the total landscape. So next, we will have Dave to talk about the uh, total landscape rate at Mars. Thank you. OK, thank you, Yashwe. And Yashwe showed the different paths that ions or charged particles from the Martian atmosphere can take as they're leaving the planet. And the next step is to be able to add all of them up to figure out how many are leaving at once. Uh, so if I can have the first image, please. One way of getting an answer to this question of how many particles are leaving is to imagine a sphere around Mars, an imaginary sphere around Mars at high altitude above the surface. And every time the MAVEN spacecraft passes through this sphere, we can look to our observations and uh, ask whether there are a lot of particles leaving the planet or not very many at all. A lot of particles are indicated in these figures by dark blue colors, and not very many are the lightish blue or whitish colors. And so over time, over many orbits and many months, we can paint a picture on this sphere of where ions are leaving in abundance and not so much. And the figure uh, suggests two things to me. There are two things that come to my attention. Number one, the colors are not evenly distributed around this sphere. On the night side of the planet, you saw a lot of dark blues, and also at the top and the bottom of the planet as well. This is consistent with what Yashwe just showed, where there are many charged particles leaving on the night side and from the top of the planet. By contrast, at the center of the day side, you see lots of white and, and lighter colors. There are not very many charged particles leaving from that location. This is also consistent with the, the observations and the simulations that Yashwe just showed. So these maps uh, provide a statistical picture of where ions are escaping in abundance from different regions. But to get a global escape rate, how much is escaping from the entire planet at once, we simply have to add up the data that are represented on those maps. When we do that, we get a number. We get a few or several times 10 to the 24 atmospheric particles leaving the planet every second. And that's a really big number. And I have personally have a hard time having any intuition for a number that has an exponent of 24 in it. So it's much more convenient for me to think of it in terms of mass. How much atmosphere, what's the mass of atmosphere escaping every second? And when we do that, we find that there are uh, roughly 100 grams of atmosphere escaping every second, or about a quarter pound of atmosphere escaping every second. And I can't help but uh, imagine hamburgers flying out of the Martian atmosphere, one per second. Uh, but fortunately, it's instead oxygen and carbon dioxide that are leaving the planet, which are important both for water and for the climate of the planet overall. So this escape rate that I just gave you is a lower limit for a couple of reasons. First of all, we've emitted low energy charged particles from the maps to this point, and also neutral particles, atmospheric particles that lack any electric charge. When both of those things are ultimately included, the escape rates that we report will only go up. So this was an average escape rate for today's conditions, but there's no expectation that that escape rate has been constant over the history of the planet, as Jasper mentioned. So if I can have the next graphic, please. In the left panel of the graphic, uh, you see Mars under normal conditions today, where the solar wind is flowing towards Mars and interacting with the atmosphere, and the rainbow-colored atmospheric particles are escaping the planet uh, in many different ways along many different paths. In the right panel of the figure, you see Mars under very different conditions, when one of these solar storms passes by and engulfs the planet. When that happens, as we've observed with MAVEN, the escape rates go up, and they go up by a factor of 10 to 20 at least during one of these solar storms that MAVEN observed, and it's by no stretch the largest solar storm that Mars has ever seen. Uh, this is exciting to me uh, to think that events like this increase escape uh, because solar storms were more common and more intense earlier in solar system history. 
So long ago, we expect escape, like as shown in the right-hand panel, to have been happening all the time and stripping away lots of atmosphere from the planet. This implies that uh, not only is the Mars atmosphere escaping today and has been escaping over time, but much of that atmosphere may have been lost early on. So the MAVEN observations are teaching us how the atmosphere of Mars has evolved, and understanding those effects will not only help us to understand the Mars atmosphere, but I'm hopeful that they'll help us to understand how atmospheres everywhere interact with their star and their space environment, including planets orbiting other stars. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Dwayne. Thanks, Dave. And for some reason, I have a craving for a hamburger, so I don't know. <laughs> Um, thank you, uh, University of Colorado and University of Iowa. Before we uh, open it up for questions, starting here and across the uh, country, uh, give the uh, principal investigator an opportunity to, to summarize why these findings are so significant. Bruce? Thank you. Uh, what we've seen is that for the first time, we have measurements that tell us not only the escape rate of gas out the top of the atmosphere and lost to space, but the processes that control it. And this is important because if we want to look backward in time, we can't just extrapolate the process, the, uh, the escape rate, without understanding how escape is occurring. When we look at the processes, we see that many of them would have been greater in the past. The escape rate today, 100 grams per second, is not a very large number. It's enough to remove the entire atmosphere in a couple of billion years, but not enough to account for the thick early atmosphere. However, when we account for the greater loss rates early in history, we think that loss to space, that stripping by the solar wind, was an important process in the changing climate of Mars. And that's what we're really trying to aim at. We're continuing the observations. Uh, we have an extended mission. We'll be looking at the second half of the first Mars year that we've been there, and we'll be looking at the changing conditions through the solar cycle. So I'm looking forward to a much improved understanding as we get into this. Dwayne? Thank you. Okay, so um, before I uh, ask the media in the room to raise their hand and wait for the mic, I want to recognize another member of the incredible MAVEN team, the pro program scientist, El Sayed Talat. Uh, and he may uh, chime in on some of the questions we have. We have a number of media on the phone. And of course, social media is abuzz with uh, questions. So are there any media here in Washington Okay, um, let's see if we can, let's just go ahead and go to the social media and um, Emily, let's, uh, what's uh, the buzz out there in the social media world? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of questions. Um, so this question was asked by a lot of our followers. Um, is the same effect occurring to the earth now or could it happen in the future? Uh, let me turn to Dave Brain to answer that one. Dave, did you copy that question? I did. So the question was, can the same kinds of things happen to Earth now or in the future? And uh, the answer is mostly yes. Earth is losing atmospheric particles. Uh, but as Jasper said, Earth has a big global magnetic field that shields the atmosphere from the solar wind. So some methods, some pathways that particles can take to escape the atmosphere of Earth are, are basically choked off compared to Mars. Other processes that we observe at Mars and are observing with MAVEN do occur at Earth. For example, the loss of particles that lack any electric charge and escape out of the polar regions of Earth's magnetic field. And so there are things that we can uh, compare between what's, what we're observing with MAVEN and what's going on at Earth even today. And then the second part of that question is uh, Earth in the future. And uh, it may be um, that someday, a long time from now, Earth's magnetic field shuts off because of a lack of uh, interior heat in the planet. When that happens, Earth becomes like a large version of Mars with all of the same escape processes occurring. Between now and then, there are time periods when the Earth's magnetic field reverses. And uh, those reversals can take a couple of hundred years at a time. During those time periods, Earth's atmosphere is left largely exposed to the solar wind. However, 100 or 200 years is a relatively short time in the grand scheme of things, and so uh, the atmospheric escape during those time periods should not be significant enough to really um, damage or impair the climate of, of Earth in a, in a very large way. Let me also add that uh, most of the stripping by the solar wind at Mars was thought to have taken place very early in the history of the solar system when the sun was much more active, when the solar wind was more intense. 
Uh, so today, the rate of loss at Mars is low. During those times when the Earth might be losing atmosphere, the rate of loss would be low. So we don't have anything to worry about in terms of the Earth's atmosphere disappearing on us. Emily, two more questions, and then we'll go to the phone lines. Great. Um, this one's from Trey on Twitter, and he asks, can you simplify what happened to the atmosphere and water on Mars? Is there an easy to understand analogy? The, the solar wind stripped it away. The analogy that, that I use is when I step out of the shower into the breeze, uh, uh, the, the water in my hair is just whisked away by the, the wind. Mind you, this is an increasingly theoretical construct. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one more? Great. Um, this one is from Dustin um, on Twitter, and he said, is it possible to reverse the effect of Mars losing its atmosphere? People talk about terraforming Mars, taking the CO2 that might be locked up in the crust and putting it back in the atmosphere. If that's where all the CO2 had gone from an early thick atmosphere, that might be possible. But with it having been stripped away to space, it's not there. It's, it's been removed from the solar system entirely, so mm -hmm. it's not possible to bring it back. Okay, we'll come back to social media and send those questions in. Again, at hashtag ask NASA. And again, a reminder that following this, we will uh, have some of the scientists get together and answer all of the questions if we don't get them answered here today. But let's go to the phone lines. And first up, we have the Houston Chronicle, uh, Mike Tolson. Mike? Yes, this is for Bruce. Um, the, my question is whether any other, um, any other element, any other uh, factor could have also contributed. Uh, of course, in popular fiction, we've seen the, uh, the speculation of, uh, of an asteroid impact having uh, uh, decimated some of the some of the atmosphere. Is there any other factor that you have been able to discern or even speculate about which would also would have contributed to atmospheric loss besides the solar wind? There are a lot of processes that have the ability to remove gas from the atmosphere. Michael mentioned some of them at the very beginning. It can go down and form carbon-bearing minerals or water-bearing minerals in the crust. Uh, you mentioned the ability of an asteroid impact to knock gas off. We've been focused on understanding the processes involving the sun as an energy driver at the top of the atmosphere. So we see evidence for stripping by the solar wind for a process called sputtering in which these accelerated ions can hit the atmosphere at high speed and eject other stuff off to space. Uh, Thermal escape in which the fastest hydrogen atoms that come from water can just be fast enough to, to uh, escape the planet directly. Photochemical processes. Uh, we're trying to piece together an overall picture of what happened to the water. And we need to look at Mars as an integrated system with a lot of different processes taking place. So we're, we're putting together this piece of the puzzle you can do theoretical models that look at the role of asteroid impact. Certainly, early in the history of the solar system, that was an important process, but it's probably not much of an ongoing process today, so it's very hard to study empirically. Next call is from Alan Boyle. Alan? Ah, thank you. On this issue of how quickly the uh, the planet may have lost its atmosphere due to solar storms versus uh, the typical solar activity. Is there a way to tease out that question? Uh, are those solar storms from the primordial days of the solar system really the culprit here, or how much of a factor uh, might you be able to find out uh, that happened to be? Thank you. That's a really good question, and I don't have a really good answer yet. What we know is that the rate of uh, removal of gas during a solar storm goes up by a factor of 10 or 20 in the, the one event we've examined in detail, and that solar storms would have been more abundant early in history. Uh, we also know that the solar wind, as a steady ongoing process, can remove gas, and that that rate would have been greater early in history. Together, we think that, that these would have been very important processes but we haven't done that extrapolation backward in time yet. 
So it's very hard to give a quantitative estimate today of which was the most important process. And also, Bruce, just to remind everybody, early on in Mars history, Mars actually did have a global magnetic field. So it had protection for a while until it cooled off enough that uh, its dynamo stopped. So that period of time is you know, under debate about when exactly it lost its magnetic field and, and then experienced much more significant atmospheric loss. Next up is uh, Camille Kyle. Carlisle, sorry, Camille, uh, Sky and Telescope Magazine. Camille? Hi. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, a smaller one. Which flare uh, CME event was it that you saw the spike in? Was it the one um, from last year where there were aurora, or was the one from this past March? And then I have a second question. Uh, we were looking at the event in March of this year. It was actually three events, one right after another. Mars is never easy. You can't examine a single event in isolation. The sun had to throw several events at us, so we have to separate out the, the different effects. We did see aurora as a result of this event, though. Uh, the, the energetic particles did trigger aurora with that event as well as the earlier one. Okay. Next up is uh, Eric Berger. And Eric, if you can give your affiliation uh, before you ask your question. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. This is Eric Berger with uh, Ars Technica. I was wondering if this uh, information from the sort of the atmospheric loss to the solar system uh, has given you any better estimate of when, you know, Mars would have been conducive for surface water, lakes, rivers, things like that, that, that kind of carved its features, you know, millions or billions of years ago. From the geology, we get a good estimate of the timing of when Mars had water. Uh, up until about 3.7 billion years ago, water seemed to be very abundant and active. So the, the stripping of the solar wind, uh, the stripping by the, the solar wind of the atmosphere, would have occurred in that same time frame. That's when the uh, extreme ultraviolet photons from the sun, when the solar wind were most intense. Uh, so we think that, that the loss of the atmosphere occurred over a few hundred million years uh, from about 4.2 to maybe 3.7 billion years ago. Next up is the, the, the Ken Kramer. Ken? Doing this, and uh, congratulations on the results. Yeah, I, I was interested actually in um, your updated thinking, which you kind of just answered about when, when the water was lost. Maybe you can review that a little bit more. Um, how, how long do you think the, the, the magnet, how long did it take to lose the magnetic field? And what, how long did the water last and it liquid form on the surface? And um, how long, um, what, what was the loss required to have a tremendous loss of water? How, how, how much more did it have to be? If it's only 100 grams a second per day, can you give us an estimate of what it would have to be to cause a tremendous loss in the past? Thank you. What we think, as Michael said, uh, what we think is that the early magnetic field that Mars had would have protected the planet from, from direct impact by the solar wind and would have kept it from stripping gas off. So it would have been the turn off of the magnetic field that would have allowed the turn on of stripping of the atmosphere by the solar wind. The evidence suggests that the magnetic field disappeared about 4.2 billion years ago. The amount of gas that we think would have to have been removed, let me start back with the current Mars atmosphere, which is, uh, has a thickness of six millibars. That's just under 1% as thick as the Earth's atmosphere. We think that you would have to remove an amount of gas about equivalent to what's in the Earth's atmosphere. So the rate would have been a, a factor, would have to have been a factor of maybe 100 higher in order to be able to remove the gas early in that time period, 100 to 1,000 times higher. And that's consistent with what some of the models have predicted uh, the, the loss rate back in early history would have been. OK, um, we're going to go back to social media. And uh, Emily, back to you. We'll take three more questions. And then we'll go to our phone lines, and then we'll wrap up. Emily? Cool, thank you. Um, this question is from Wes, and he asks, how does the new information, like today's announcement, shape future research on Mars? What should we look at next? 
let me give a, a try at that one. That's a, an important question. Because one of the things that we've learned, not just from MAVEN, but from the whole suite of missions that we've sent, Curiosity and Opportunity, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Mars Odyssey most recently, that is, is that Mars is a very complex system. You can't study the geology in isolation from everything else or the atmosphere in isolation from everything else. It's a very complex, coupled system. So when we want to learn, for example, about life, uh, the potential for life, we have to study the atmosphere, the geology, and now we have to study the upper atmosphere to learn about the history of the climate. All of these play a role because the gases can exchange between all of these places. All of them represent important processes. So MAVEN is filling a, a gap in our understanding where we had really very little idea of how the upper atmosphere operated and of what processes played a role there. This feeds back into our understanding of the behavior of the climate as a whole and what drove climate change on Mars, and that feeds back into issues related to the potential for life. And I brought it back to the life question because that's really at the center of a lot of uh, scientific exploration of Mars. Mars um, appears to meet all of the conditions required for life or to have met them at the surface in the past. And that begs the question of whether there was ever any life there. And then if there was, whether it's genetically related to terrestrial life or rep would represent an independent origin. So as we go into the future, I think these questions about life and climate and the history of the planet as a whole really are at the center of the exploration. Emily, two more. Yeah, sure. Um, this one's from Dakota, and he asks, if this atmosphere, I think you sort of touched on this as well, but if this atmospheric erosion from the solar wind is still happening, will Mars eventually have no atmosphere at all? The, at, at the current rate of escape, it would lose its entire atmosphere in another couple of billion years. But we think that the, atmos the, the gas in the atmosphere isn't all that's there. There's gas locked up in the polar caps. The atmosphere exchanges with gas in the top meter of the subsurface and deeper to the top tens of meters. So one of the questions about Mars is what's the total volatile inventory? How much gas is there anywhere on the planet? As we remove gas to space, we think that it is probably being replenished from these non-atmospheric reservoirs. So I think the atmosphere is not going to disappear in the next couple of billion years, but I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be like either. One more, and then we'll go back to the phones. Sure. This one's from William, um, and sort of branching off of that, if there was liquid water found on, on Mars, wouldn't that prove that there's still atmosphere that's sustainable to some type of life? The, 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 the question of liquid water is at the heart of this, and the reason we flew the MAVEN mission is to understand the history of liquid water by looking at the climate. Water can exist could have existed at the surface early in history and it was stable. But water can exist at the surface today, but as a transient. And some of the recent measurements from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter suggest there might even be trace amounts of liquid water occurring intermittently even at the present epoch. So we have this contrast of global scale liquid water that has evolved along with the climate over four billion years and is being explored by MAVEN, and tiny amounts of transient liquid water that might be present today. It's all part of this picture of understanding the behavior and history of liquid water. And to add to that, Bruce, a little bit is um, the suspicion that uh, there's still water on Mars. We certainly have measurements of, of ice showing us at the poles and in the mid-latitudes, but also the suspicion that maybe there can be aquifers on Mars. So if life ever did get started, perhaps the, the habitable place on Mars today would be in, in the subsurface where liquid water is still a reasonable uh, presumption. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming up uh, about 15 minutes to 20 minutes. Um, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to the phone lines, we're gonna take three more calls, and then we're gonna, we have a question here at headquarters and we're gonna end the uh, briefing 
But social media, keep those questions coming in at hashtag AskNASA. Again, we will have a team of scientists answering your questions later today. And for the media that we don't get to on the phone, uh, we will make sure that scientists are available to do any one-on-one -on -one interviews following the press conference. So let's start with Adrian LaFranc. Hope I got that name right, Adrian, from the Atlantic. Adrian? Thanks for taking my question. Um, I understand that the unusual auroras on Mars also inform your understanding of atmospheric loss, and I'm hoping you can describe just sort of in vivid detail what an aurora on Mars looks like, how it's different from the appearance of northern lights on Earth. And let me ask Dave Brain if he can take that one as well. Sure, thanks. Uh, that's a great question, and, and aurora on Mars are really exciting and really interesting. And there are uh, essentially two kinds of aurora on Mars that have been observed. One that we knew about even before MAVEN arrived. And these are aurora fairly similar to Earth's aurora at the North Pole and the South Pole that take place in really small scale magnetic fields uh, that are associated with specific regions of the Mars crust. And the big difference there is that the Mars aurora in the small magnetic fields are weaker than those observed at Earth. But the uh, excitement for MAVEN is that a new kind of aurora was observed at Mars uh, that frankly surprised us. And this was aurora in a part of the atmosphere uh, that is above regions that don't have any magnetic field at all. And it's strange to think about, uh, based on our personal experience, aurora that don't take place in magnetic fields. And not only did we see aurora on Mars in the form of ultraviolet light detected by MAVEN's instruments, but we also saw the particles that went crashing into the atmosphere to create them. And these are very energetic electrons that come from the sun. And those intense electron events are at least rare in MAVEN's experience. They've only happened two or three times since we've been there, including around Christmas 2014. So among the team, we're calling those the Christmas lights. But they also happened during the solar storm that Jasper talked about uh, in his comments as well. So we've seen these aurora in ultraviolet, and uh, it's possible that the new kind of aurora lights up the entire night sky over much of the planet. And you can do model calculations of whether those aurora would be visible to the naked eye. And those model calculations are still premature, but uh, a good guess is that they may be visible to the naked eye, so that if you're standing on the night side of Mars in a place where there's no light pollution, and you're looking up at the sky, you could see the whole sky light up during one of these events. It would be magnificent. Thank you, Dave. Next up is Frank Mooring from Aviation Week. Frank? Uh, thank you. Dr. Jacosi, you, you mentioned earlier that um, comet impacts might have had uh, a role in, in the loss of Mars's atmosphere. I wonder if, it's, if you can say yet whether the um, passage of the comet sighting spring close to Mars last fall um, might have had the same kind of effect. Uh, we, we did uh, have the opportunity to observe one comet pass by, as you mentioned, Comet Sighting Spring. It passed by only 140,000 kilometers away from Mars, and we were able to make some observations of the effects that it had on the upper atmosphere of the planet at the time. Uh, we saw the, the dust that was deposited from the comet into the atmosphere, and perhaps hints of some other things. The, the dust coming in has the ability to change the composition and to drive chemical processes in the upper atmosphere, but comets are relatively rare. Perhaps more significant is the regular interplanetary dust that's coming in all the time. This has its origin with comets, but it's not associated with a specific comet passing by. It's just always there, always coming in. MAVEN, in fact, has for the first time detected what we think is this dust coming in from interplanetary space, and it would have the effect of producing a long-lived, long-standing uh, layer of, of metal ions in the upper atmosphere and creating a layer in the ionosphere, and the energetics of that, the chemical processes driven by that may be affecting the atmosphere as a whole. So we see this dust, whether it's from comets or interplanetary dust, as a possible driver of energetic processes in the upper atmosphere that can lead to escape or can contribute to escape, but it's not a direct connection. And, and I couldn't tell you today how much escape it's driving. Next up, we have Tracy Watson from USA Today. 
Tracy? Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my question. So I understand that you've kind of quantified the amount of atmospheric loss that can occur during a big solar storm, but can you help me out to understand how this gets you closer to understanding what happened uh, eons ago? Because from what I from what I can heard today, you haven't quantified whether that whether the storms could were enough to, to to strip away a large part of the atmosphere. Thanks. The ideal situation would have been to observe the solar wind early in Mars history as it was stripping away uh, gas from the atmosphere, but NASA tends not to fund four billion year long missions. So we settle for looking at the atmosphere today, understanding the processes and trying to extrapolate backwards in time. Today the, the main result is that we're talking about is a much better understanding of the loss out the atmosphere today and of the processes driving it. I'm only waving my arms a little bit on what this did over time because the team has been so focused on what's going on today that we haven't had the chance to do that extrapolation backward in time. But all the indications are that the loss rate at the greater rate early, appropriate for early in history would have been adequate to remove a very large atmosphere and go take us from a warm, wet planet early in history to the cold, dry planet today. So I'm going to have to ask you to hang on uh, until we can do that analysis, and then we'll give you a much more quantitative, quantitative estimate. Okay, one last question from the phone, and then we're, we'll come here uh, in Washington. Uh, Tom? Of climate change that happened to Mars, what kind of lessons do you think it could have for people who are studying how Earth's climate is evolving or it could change rapidly? The processes that we're looking at. There's Tom. Yes, yeah, thank you. Congratulations to the Maiden team. I'm curious, uh, after doing all this in-depth study, climate change are thought to be very different from the processes that drive Earth climate change, especially when the, the climate change, when you use those words uh, here for the Earth, most people think that applies to the potential for human-induced climate change. So it's really comparing apples and oranges, uh, there's not a direct comparison that I want to make, uh, but we do get a better understanding of atmospheric processes in general. Michael, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's about right. I mean, certainly Mars, all the climate change that we've seen has been uh, induced by the failure of the global magnetic field on Mars and then the consequences of interacting mostly with the s solar wind. On Earth, it's a, an entirely different story in which uh, we are seeing uh, human-generated heating of the atmosphere. Okay, if you can give your name and affiliation and your question, please. Thank you. Marsha Freeman with the Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, we've had uh, little atmospheric stations on the surface of Mars on a number of landers for a number of years, and you mentioned that some of the solar wind processes could be accelerating ions, not just to escape, but various other, you know, down rather than up. Is any of the data from any of the surface instruments useful for the study that you are doing? And sort of contingent to that, would it be helpful for you to have balloons uh, and something in between the surface and an orbiter? There, there is an experiment on the Curiosity rover that's very relevant to what MAVEN is measuring. It may measures the radiation environment at the surface. And the particles that make it to the surface are the same particles that hit the top of the atmosphere. So one of the things we're hoping to do is to couple those measurements together and with measurements at the top and at the bottom of the atmosphere, really understand uh, uh, what the radiation environment is and what drives it. In terms of climate, we have, we've had multiple stations at the surface. We also have climate-related measurements being made from orbiting spacecraft. Uh, for example, the Mars Climate Sounder on the reconnaissance orbiter which is measuring the properties of the main part of the atmosphere. All of this couples together and by, by measuring the different pieces of the atmosphere at the same time or even at different times, we can understand the coupling between them. To give you one example, by understanding the lower atmosphere, we understand the ways in which 
atmospheric waves generated in the bottom part of the atmosphere can work their way up into the top of the atmosphere and deposit energy and mix things up. And that's an important component of understanding the behavior of the upper atmosphere. So again, I want to come back to this theme of Mars as a very complex system in which all the pieces are coupled together. And we need to understand each one separately, but also how they couple together. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap up here. Let me first thank our folks uh, that have joined us from our universities. First, Jasper Helicus from the University of Iowa in Iowa City. Thank you again, Jasper. And of course, our folks at the University of Colorado, Yasue Dong and Dave Brain. Again, keep those questions coming in on social media at hashtag AskNASA. Team of scientists will be answering your questions as quickly as possible for media. We will be taking your calls and requests and set up uh, team members to answer your questions. And of course, all of this information and more is online at www.nasa.gov slash maven. Thanks for joining us. The journey to Mars continues. Thank you, guys.
Moderator Victor Joseph, President of Tanana Chiefs Conference, Deputy Secretary of the Department of the Interior Mike Connor, Council on Environmental Quality Director Christy Goldfuss, and Office of Science and Technology Policy Director Dr. John Holdren. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to just thank all the tribal leaders, our tribal youth, and all of our esteemed guests that are here today. And we're going to be following the same format that the previous panels have. First, I'm going to be asking the um, panelists to give a brief two to three minute description on what they're doing in their agency to strengthen the nation to nation uh, relationships with the tribes. Also ask them, what are they doing to fulfill their trust responsibility? And what are they doing to create permanency to these initiatives? Following that, we're going to be uh, asking a series of questions that, been, that you've all chose and sent in to be submitted. So I know that you're not here to listen to me. So I'll get right to business. And we'll start with our Deputy Secretary Mike Connor, Department of the Interior, and ask him to give his brief two to three minutes description of nation to nation, on, also on your, your trust responsibility and permanency. Thank you, Victor. I very much appreciate the opportunity. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to be here at the Tribal Nations uh, and invest in this dialogue, which uh, uh, is growing in importance given the challenges that uh, we collectively face uh, in building that nation-to-nation -nation relationship, uh, protecting uh, long-term the tribal interests that are at stake, uh, and uh, ensuring that we can do what we can uh, to make as permanent as possible the great strides that we've made in this administration. And from that perspective, I would just say, um, uh, I have a Native American ancestry, uh, one quarter uh, Taos Pueblo. I'm not an enrolled member uh, of the Pueblo, but uh, it's part of my background. And so from my perspective, it's been you know, the opportunity of a lifetime to come into this administration, work for this president, uh, for two secretaries uh, now who have uh, placed the uh, relationship with uh, tribal governments at the highest level of our responsibilities at the Department of the Interior. So. Building that nation-to-nation -nation relationship starts with uh, uh, trust and uh, consultation, dialogue, respect. Uh, we have certainly, I think, made great strides in that area and will continue to do that. We are not uh, perfect, I would be the first to acknowledge, uh, but we can continue to move the ball forward with respect to that consultation and that uh, dialogue and continuing to get rid of the uh, the lawsuits that have, I think, affected that relationship. We've done a, a very good job uh, working with the Interior Department, Justice Department, the uh, rest of the administration, uh, and uh, moving forward to a new era where we are uh, having that mutual respect, uh, truly listening, responding, and now, I think, as we go into the last year of this administration, working on the permanency of these programs and institutionalizing as much as we can. And we'll get into some of those details. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Michael Connor. Connor. Um, next, Managing Director Christy Goldfuss, Council on Environmental Quality. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And just to describe a little bit uh, how Dr. Holdren and I fit into this scenario. So the White House is a little complicated. It has 11 components. So separate from the Department of the Interior or uh, USDA or other agencies, there is a whole set of us that work within the White House. And I head up the Council of Environmental Quality, which is responsible for not only advising the president on environmental issues, but also implementing something called the National Environmental Policy Act. And at the core of what is known as NEPA, many of you may be familiar with it, is stakeholder engagement. And so we have the distinct pleasure of talking to many, many different constituencies. And obviously, when it comes to uh, talking nation to nation, talking to tribes, this is a uh, responsibility that we have to make sure that everyone is at the table and we're hearing all of the concerns up front. So the president has taken uh, really unprecedented action. Many of you heard um, recently he traveled up to Alaska 
participated in a round table uh, with many uh, Alaska Native leaders and really heard firsthand what some of these issues are when it comes to consultation uh, and engaging upfront on what your concerns are. So as Mike said, in this last year, what we are very focused on is making sure that we have a good handle on what we can finish between now and the end and hearing from you uh, continually on how we make progress in the next 13, 14 months. It keeps passing so quickly. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Director Do Dr. John Holdren, Office of Science and Technology Policy, please. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have been President Obama's chief science advisor since the beginning of the Obama administration in 2009. And in the context of this meeting, I think of two things that he said to me and his other senior advisors in the first week that we worked with him. One of the things he said was that the challenges that we face as a nation, whether they're the challenges of job creation and sustainable economic growth, the challenges of getting better health care outcomes for more Americans at affordable cost, whether they're the challenges of energy and climate change or the challenges of national and homeland security, all of those challenges are so daunting and our resources so limited that the only option is partnership. The only option is cooperation. And that means we, the federal government, need to work with state, local, and tribal leaders. We need to work with the private sector. We need to work with civil society. We need, as the president has repeatedly said, all hands on deck. And everything that we've been doing in all of these domains, economy, technology, energy, climate change, national and homeland security, we've been doing that. The second thing that the president said is that in his view, one of the most important things we can do for the future of our country is to lift our game in science, technology, engineering, and math education. And doing that, lifting our game, is again, in large part, a matter of inclusion. We have not been tapping the talent pool that is out there in our nation in all its diversity. The talent that's available in the Native American community, the Hispanic community, the African-American community, the talent that's available in women and girls who are underrepresented in STEM fields. And so we have been working very hard on STEM inclusion, at linking up with all of the groups that are working together to provide inspiration, engagement, teaching, mentoring, and opportunity for all of these groups, including Native Americans who have been underrepresented in STEM fields, and whose underrepresentation is not only a loss for the young people in these groups who could be succeeding and enjoying exciting and rewarding careers in these fields, but it's a loss for the nation because we're losing the application of those talents to all those challenges that I talked about. Thank you, Dr. Holden. As everyone knows, the permanency is a very important issue to the tribes, to all the tribes of the United States. In addition to that, as we look at the strides that were made by this administration around nation to nation on trust responsibility and also um, the, just making these permanency, I really appreciate the efforts that you all taken in this. Following that, I'm going to be asking uh, a variety of questions, and it's going to cover several different topic items around climate change, the environmental impacts, which include on our land and water rights. So I'll go to first to Deputy Secretary Michael Connor. Tribes on the West Coast are facing the devastating impacts of the droughts, and we need to address this problem before it gets worse. How is DOI addressing the issue tribes are facing due to the lack of water, especially the long-term effects of this drought? I've spent a good part of my uh, tenure as Deputy Secretary and, and prior to that running the Bureau of Reclamation on working uh, this specific issue of drought. Uh, and certainly uh, the way Interior responds, and it applies equally to how we deal with tribal nations with drought, is we have to immediately respond to the uh, most urgent impacts of drought. So in some cases uh, that has to do with water supply, basic water supply. We have a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure for those tribes who have infrastructure, and I recognize that there are some who don't, uh, there is whether or not that infrastructure is set up to deal with uh, the very low uh, water levels in streams, in uh, aquifers that are depleting. And so in a lot of cases, our drought response programs are immediately geared towards how can we provide water, 
uh, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Reclamation, and how can we do some infrastructure modifications. We're always trying to deal with the immediacy of the situation. In another situation uh, on the West Coast this year, not just the basic provision of water or water for agricultural needs, is the impact of the lack of water resources on tribal fisheries. Uh, and that's an incredibly uh, uh, tough issue to deal with in terms of drought, uh, given the condition of our fisheries. Uh, every year matters in how we allow salmon to return, propagate, and, and head back out to, to the ocean. And so uh, we've had to take emergency action for the last several years uh, on the uh, Klamath River, the lower Klamath River, to supplement flows, uh, working very closely with the tribes uh, who uh, have treaty, uh, treaty trust uh, interests in the fishery itself. Uh, and so there's a whole range of immediate actions that we need to take. But in addition to water, I just want to uh, also acknowledge uh, with drought comes impacts to water supply and heightened fire risk. Uh, and certainly, uh, Victor, you saw that in Alaska this year, uh, where more work uh, burned there than in the lower 48, and one of the highest uh, fire years that we've had so far. Uh, so that has been an area, once again, where uh, our immediate response to the fires over 8 million acres were burned uh, across uh, the western United States, sure, uh, that places it in the top five, uh, I think, top ten for sure, uh, fire years that we've had. Uh, we've had to deal with that from a suppression standpoint. Uh, we had to gear up for it in working uh, the preparedness angle with uh, tribes. Uh, but overall, whether it's fire or water, in addition to that immediate response, we need to work on the mid and long term actions to deal with the implications of drought and fire risk. And we are trying in all cases to not just to respond to that uh, immediate need, but to structure our programs so that we're building in conservation, basic infrastructure, uh, fisheries protections that can uh, build resiliency in drought years. And of course, we've got a proposal that uh, Secretary Jewell talked about. Uh, I think we've talked about ad nauseum, but uh, our budget the proposal to reform how we fund our fire suppression activities is just critical so that we can fund other programs uh, and get in front of the curve and build some Uh, resiliency through fuels reduction, through improvement of our forests uh, overall. In uh, Alaska, when we did go up there, and also just in general, how we're looking at environmental sustainability. This is both environmental sustainability and, as you know, cultural sustainability, and really a connection to um, people's history and overall connection to their community. And what we heard over and over again uh, in the conversations that we had in Alaska and with rural communities is sometimes the worst actor is the federal government and how we fund some of the projects. Uh, there was one, one community that we heard about that was going to get funding for a school but would have to build the school in the exact same location um, and wouldn't be allowed to move it, even knowing that that spot might not exist in 10 years because of coastal erosion problems. So one of the, one of the proposals that we heard uh, through these listening sessions was really an idea of how can we make sure that if there is local leadership and if there are proposals on the ground uh, to really build more resilient communities, how can we be responsive to that leadership through the federal dollars? How can we make sure that when taxpayer dollars go towards any of uh, any community building in rural communities that we have multiple benefits? So it's a school, it can also be a shelter if there's a storm, it can also serve as a community center so that 
the dollar goes further, but also we're being responsive to the local leadership on the ground. So CEQ specifically um, helped along with OSTP and our other partners in the White House lead the state local tribal leaders task force looking at these resilient issues, resiliency issues, and our partnership with local leadership uh, on the ground to answer some of these real questions about how do we get funding to the highest needs, how do we really respond to the local leaders who know what those needs are and make sure that we get the best outcome when we're spending dollars to build infrastructure or support communities. So I think for us that is a big piece of unfinished business in the last uh, year here in our resilience work. How do we make sure those federal dollars go to the communities that need them most and are spent smart so that we're not building in places where we know we're just going to have to build it again in two years or invest uh, in some, some other project later on down the road. Thank you. Director John Holdren. How will climate change impact tribes and does the administration have a plan to help tribes across Indian country combat and address the impacts of climate change? Well, first of all, climate change is already impacting people all across the United States. Uh, it's impacting them in the form of more extremely hot days and longer heat waves, in the form of more of total rainfall coming in extreme downpours associated, of course, with flooding. It's coming in the form, as we've already been discussing here, of uh, longer and more intense droughts, longer wildfire seasons and larger annual areas burned by wildfires. It's coming in the form of a warming, acidifying, and rising ocean. And in the far north, it's coming in the form of disappearing sea ice uh, in the summer. All of these impacts have a particular force for many of our Native American communities. In the southwest, of course, heat, drought, wildfires are all terribly important, and they're all getting worse. In the far north, the disappearance of the sea ice is leading, as uh, Christy was mentioning, to coastal erosion, leading to uh, major storms, which previously had their storm waves kept at bay by the sea ice, now cutting into the land, sea level, is rising. We're having severe impacts on subsistence fishing and subsistence hunting uh, in those communities, among the other impacts they have to cope with. Some of those communities are going to have to move because the land on which they're sitting will be uh, before too long underwater. The government, the federal government, is doing uh, a lot of things in partnership with Native American communities to address those problems. One is, of course, the provision of resources to help people cope with those damages, to figure out how and where they can move their dwellings, move their settlements to uh, escape the coastal erosion and the rising sea level. Providing data and tools so that local planners and decision makers uh, have access to the information they need to see where climate change is going, what kinds of impacts it will have, how they can minimize uh, the damage to their communities. We put together, when the president uh, initially released his climate action plan, a state, local, and tribal leaders task force to advise the federal government on what we could do to be more useful to the folks on the ground who are having to cope with these problems. That task force produced over 100 recommendations to the federal government on what we needed. And we have been engaged now in an interagency council to implement those recommendations. And that is one of the ways institutionalizing these operations that we can be sure that they will continue uh, beyond this administration. When the president, by executive order, set up the National Ocean Council, which Christy Goldfuss and I co-chair. That executive order embedded the participation of Native American communities in all the planning and thinking uh, and the provision of resources that the National Ocean Council is engaged in. In January of this year, the president, by executive order, created the Arctic Executive Steering Committee to coordinate and help prioritize and implement the programs of the 20-plus federal departments and agencies that have responsibilities in the Arctic. And among the several responsibilities that he gave to that council, which I chair, is improving our interactions with and our support for the state, local, and tribal leaders 
in the far north and in the Arctic who are again so much engaged with coping with the stresses of climate change in that part of the world. I think we have one of the participants in the task force potentially in the audience, Karen Diver, who, let me make sure I get the title right, chairwoman of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Is Karen here? Well, she was supposed to attend. Yay! They're all the way in the back. Hi, Karen. (laughs) Not coming to work for us. So we're still looking at those recommendations and ticking through them as we can. Thank you. Deputy Secretary Connor, your second question is, tribes must continually fight for their water rights. Access to our water resources is vital component of our tribe's ability to provide for their families and their communities. And it's also an important driver for economic development. When can a tribes expect the restoration of water rights, and how is DOI planning to expedite water compacts and settlements? It's a, it's a great question because of, uh, I think, the, the growing recognition that water is so fundamental to, to uh, all kinds of success on uh, reservations, and certainly the fulfillment of treaty rights. Um, water is at the center uh, of all of that. Uh, so first of all, I would say the protection of those treaty rights and the uh, pursuit of the recognition of Indian water rights claims is something that I think historically has been viewed as a, an interior department function uh, with the Department of Justice helping us in that process. But I, I think one of the, the ways that we have made a significant transition in this administration is bringing administration-wide support for uh, moving forward with these Indian Water Rights uh, Settlement. Uh, Christy and John, I, they've been great partners in recognizing that the programs that we're trying to uh, address, uh, whether it's resiliency building, whether it's uh, using, find the best uh, science and technology uh, in Indian country, uh, you can move the needle forward through the uh, settlement resolution of Indian Water Rights claims. So we've gotten a lot of support not just because it's important to Indian country, but it fulfills broader goals of the administration. Uh, And so uh, from the White House to OMB, uh, I'll repeat that, yes, OMB, uh, because there's always been this historical, you know, the Interior Department would say, well, we support you, but we can't get OMB. There's none of that these days. We sit in a room, we work uh, administration-wide to come up with positions that we can support that really, I think, help fulfill uh, the goals, which is to protect the water rights, uh, those treaty rights for tribes, and move forward as quickly as possible, given the importance of water. Um, and with that, I would say, how do, how do we uh, restore and uh, move forward? Uh, we're doing that now. We have had, over time, I think 33 overall Indian water rights settlements, 29 which have had congressional enactment. Uh, Right now, we have, uh, I believe, 20 implementation teams at the Department of the Interior. Uh, We are moving forward with implementation. Some of those settlements have already been fully implemented, which usually means going into court, adjudicating the water rights that have been resolved through that settlement, and then making the investments in infrastructure and with with respect to tribal capacity building uh, to allow the use of that water and the ongoing protection from a tribal government standpoint of those water resources. We are very proud uh, of the fact that we have just increased the investments that we're making uh, on an annual basis. For instance, I think we had $172 million in our budget in 2015 to implement existing Indian water rights settlements across Interior. Our 2016 budget proposal was $245 million. Uh, We recognize we need to keep on track in in implementing those settlements, uh, and we've gotten great support in the administration. Beyond that, we need to continue to um, uh, negotiate uh, new Indian water rights settlements and enact those that are teed up and ready to go. And we've got a number uh, in front of the Congress right now. Uh, I'd say uh, several of them. Uh, If we haven't already fully signed off and saying the administration supports, we're uh, very, very close. I think in all the legislative proposals that I'm familiar with, I shouldn't say all, that's a a big category. Uh, 
but in several of the mature ones, I know we've at least negotiated most 90% uh, or more of the issues, and we're just trying to get to that last uh, point where we can say to the Congress, uh, we support these Indian Water Rights Settlements. They should be enacted. We've had six in this administration. Uh, we'd like to get more before uh, uh, all is said and done. Um, and beyond that, I would just make a quick note. In addition to settlements, I think across the board, uh, and, and Kevin talked about the support that we get from uh, Secretary Jewell across the board in our programs, and this is one of those. It's not just Indian Water Rights Settlements. It's our drought response program in the Bureau of Reclamation. It's the planning programs within the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We have upped the budget and the resources uh, within the Interior Department, our Water Smart program, where we have now uh, working with grants uh, to tribal communities to improve uh, their ability to access water, to make efficient use of those water resources. It's settlements, but it's all these other programs that we can bring to the table too and work with tribes on a daily basis. Thank you. Managing Director Gofus, how does this administration honor its treaty and trust responsibility to ensure that tribal treaty subsistence <clears throat> are being appropriately protected when states have oversight of the water quality standards that contain our subsistence resources? So I'm gonna ask Mike to help me on this one a little bit, but I'll start with uh, just saying consultation, consultation, consultation. We need to constantly be talking and learning and hearing where uh, the issues are and where the priorities are for uh, everyone who's impacted in these decisions. And really, when you look across the federal agencies that we have right now with Secretary Jewell and Mike and certainly uh, Kevin Washburn, these are really uh, creative leaders that have figured out how we can put together um, more consultation, more discussions, and really move this ball forward in a way that we haven't before. So I, I really think it's all about throughout the federal government making sure that we have the right policies in place and right opportunities for engagement so that we are aware of where the subsistence issues are and that we are not um, making decisions that in any way impact uh, what is so important to you. Mike, would you, would you add anything on that in terms of? I think you're exactly right. It starts with consultation and understanding uh, the tribe's uh, perspective on their treaty rights, uh, the ways that we uh, can uh, employ services and actions uh, to protect those treaty rights. And I think, you know, once again, um, the expansion of who's all needs to come to the table to help as a federal government as a whole, not just the Interior Department, not just pockets of the White House, but uh, all of the agencies in working together to try and use the resources they have, the programs that they have to protect those uh, treaty rights. Uh, and once again, I think that's an area where we've made significant progress, but we need to continue uh, that effort. Thank you. Director Holdren. Does the administration have any plans to provide help to the coastal tribes that are facing rising ocean levels due to climate change and have no choice but to rebuild and move to higher ground due to a loss of land to the rising tides? Absolutely we do. Um, we have um, provided the Climate Resilience Toolkit with a whole host of tools and best practices uh, to the local leaders who are uh, confronting this problem the National Science Foundation, the Department of Interior, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration are working directly with the affected tribes to provide resources and support for dealing with that set of challenges. Uh, the Arctic Executive Steering Committee that I mentioned that was set up in January in which I chair has a coastal erosion working group that is uh, co-chaired by the Department of Interior and the Council on Environmental Quality, the folks uh, on my right that has been working on the severe erosion issues uh, in Alaskan villages such as Shishmaref and Kivalina and Nutok. Uh, that group is very active and it has been linking the resources of the federal government, the state government and the tribal uh, organizations, the Native American villages to, uh, to address that challenge. I would note that when President Obama uh, was in Alaska at the end of the summer and he was the first sitting US president ever to go to the Arctic, uh, the administration rolled out more than 40 new commitments to work with state, local, and tribal uh, officials 
on the issues confronting those groups, and a number of those were directly addressed to the Native American uh, issues. We've had uh, a series of, of recent uh, achievements in that domain in October. The Environmental Protection Agency rolled out its first round of program grants to nine Alaska Native villages. In October as well, the U.S. Department of Agriculture made available uh, $10 million in high energy cost grants to Alaska communities. That's a big deal up there, as you know. Uh, and this week, uh, Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox will be traveling uh, to Alaska to discuss transportation issues, and he will be holding a roundtable with uh, Alaska Native stakeholders to uh, address a lot of these issues. And can I just add, um, Please. so the visit was wonderful, and the president was clearly touched by what he saw when he was in Alaska. But I would say when we came back, the message was very clear to us that it was wonderful that we had a great trip uh, and that we had the opportunity to meet with everyone, but it would not matter if we didn't deliver on those commitments. And we were all told very clearly uh, that this was just the beginning of a lot of work. So Secretary Fox's visit, the cabinet overall uh, has been making trips up there. So we are very invested in making sure that what, was, what we learned, what we saw, uh, up in Alaska, will we will continue to deliver on that. So uh, I, I just, for any folks who thought that was just a great publicity moment, which it was, uh, it also will have greater value as time goes on and we're able to make good on each of the commitments and promises we made when we were up there. And, and just so you know how this works, the president explained it to them and then they've explained <laughs> it to us at the <laughs> departmental level. and. Uh, we're explaining it to the staff and so on and so forth. Well, and I think both Secretary Kerry and the President <laughs> saw that Secretary Jewell it was, is quite um, a rock star up in Alaska <laughs> and got quite several rounds of applause because long before this trip, DOI has a long-standing commitment uh, to the communities up there. Secretary's a rock star. <laughs> 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 got it. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for expanding on that question. Deputy Secretary, your next question. Even today, the government's tribal commitments are unfulfilled. Is the interior dedicated to the restoration of tribal lands? If so, how will the interior further solidify its dedication to the restoration of tribal lands? Uh, the first part of the question is probably uh, the easiest one that I can answer all day, yes. Uh, the department is actually uh, is absolutely committed to the restoration of tribal homelands. We, uh, you know, uh, Professor Washburn, our uh, Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, is always great about uh, uh, providing context as we have our staff discussions about Indian policy and reminding us of the failures of our Indian policy for quite a long time uh, in taking away. Uh, uh, lands from tribes, and then particularly uh, the very much failed allotment policy and the dis devastation that that had in, in uh, Indian country. And so with that context, uh, we can't do anything but be as supportive as we can in carrying out our programs uh, to try and help tribes work towards the restoration uh, of their homelands. And there's been a reinvigorated approach take, taking lands into trust. Uh, within the department uh, under the Assistant Secretary's leadership and the Secretary's leadership. Uh, we have set our goal for ourselves, as uh, I think we've talked about earlier in the conference, of uh, 500,000 acres, taking that uh, in land into trust. Uh, we are um, more than halfway there, uh, uh, almost two-thirds. We've got uh, over 300,000 uh, acres that we've taken into trust, and we are certainly uh, working with a number of tribal communities to. Uh, continue towards that overall goal. Um, in addition to those new lands being taken into trust, working very closely with tribes, uh, there is the land buyback program of the Cobell settlement, uh, which uh, gets to the heart of that, uh, uh, trying to uh, come back from that failed allotment policy. Uh, the issue of fractionated interests uh, within Indian country uh, and the checkerboard uh, that exists uh, on many reservations uh, impacts uh, the tribes and it, their ability to uh, pursue economic activity, pr pursue opportunities for the benefit of the tribal communities. 
and it doesn't do much for the individual landowners who, you know, through that uh, uh, process, process of, uh, of dividing this upon the death of the previous owners, uh, just continues to create smaller and smaller uh, percentages of ownership uh, where individuals can't uh, uh, get the economic value out of their land. So the buyback program, uh, as we know, is a result of the Cobell settlement because that was one of the fundamental issues that needed to be addressed. Uh, creates record keeping problems, uh, all kinds of things. So uh, we received $1.6 billion uh, through legislation enacted at the end of 2010. The settlement was finalized in 2012. We have 10 years now to put that $1.6 billion to use to go across the approximately 150 locations in Indian country that have this uh, uh, fractionated interest problem. Um, and uh, from that standpoint, we have been wildly successful uh, from standing up the program, uh, working very, very closely with tribal leadership, uh, taking into account their concerns about how we would uh, put together this program, educating individual landowners, and ultimately starting with uh, making uh, offers in uh, December of 2013 to now, uh, we've expended approximately $715 million, almost half of the resources uh, of that program. Uh, we've uh, restored the equivalent of about 1.5 million acres to tribal ownership. This is taking land, uh, purchasing it from those individual landowners on a willing seller basis and restoring immediately as part of that transaction, that, la that land to tribal trust ownership. Uh, so we're very proud of the progress that we've made uh, and the progress that we expect to make uh, over the next year that I think will take uh, and ensure that the program will be successful over that 10 year period. Then the question is, how do we continue uh, a program uh, in a similar manner to continue the progress that's been made? Uh, other things I would just mention, taking land into trust for Alaska tribes, uh, as a result of court uh, action, uh, clarified our authority to do that. We very quickly stood up that program and moved forward. Uh, and so there are all kinds of ways, I think, that we are doing our best to, to uh, uh, work with tribes in the restoration of their homelands. We, continue, we will continue to do more. Uh, we will also continue to gauge with tribes in their interests of how we manage our land and resources, too, because uh, of the interests that they have. Uh, particularly from a cultural standpoint in, in that area. Okay, thank you. We have about two minutes left. Sure. And so I'll ask We'll my... split it. We'll go quick time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How is the CEQ ensuring that the tribes are given appropriate support and funding when we face devastating climate and environmental impacts? This builds a little on what Dr. Holdren uh, already spoke about in terms of resilience. I mean, as Dr. Holdren mentioned, the impacts of climate change are being experienced now by your community. So whether it's coastal erosion or drought, as Mike mentioned, or wildfire, uh, these are extreme impacts. So when it comes to the funding needs, uh, either to build more resilient communities or uh, to respond in the face of a disaster, we are looking at all the options to make sure, and this doesn't sound very sexy when you're talking about resilience, um, it doesn't sound sexy to make sure that we're organizing our priorities and the funding goes out appropriately, uh, but it can have the greatest impact to make sure that the grants and uh, the assistance that we give to communities responds to the right problems and allows you to have the flexibility to build your community the way you want to and have plans um, that support your ov overall needs. And that's really where we're focused. Where do we have the ability over this time period uh, to remove barriers and make sure that the funding is being used for the right problems and to address the right climate challenges on the ground? John, you want to add anything to that? Because this has been a focus of the Arctic. Yep. No, no good? I think you said it well. OK. All right. I'm not, it's a big challenge. So we'll, we'll see how far we get on this one. But we are trying some pilots and some focused areas. We get it right. Thank you very much. Well, I want to uh, thank our tribal leaders for allowing me the opportunity to moderate this panel. Please help me extend our appreciation to our esteemed panelists from the office of the White House and the Department of Interior. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Good job. Thank you.
from smoke signals. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. The program will resume shortly.
Clinkit, and Denina Athabaskan, Braden White of the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, Blossom Johnson of the Navajo Nation, Philip Douglas of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma, and moderator Jude Schimmel of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President of the United States. I think I'm supposed to make remarks first, but I was just feeling so comfortable, I sat down. <laughs> Let me go to the podium first. All right, all right, I'm going to go to the podium. I just feel so comfortable with friends here that I was just getting kind of relaxed. Uh, but I'm going to start off by making some remarks. Everybody, please have a seat. Uh, it is wonderful to be with all of you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jude and, and the whole panel here of outstanding young people who are going to participate in this panel. I want to thank our outstanding Interior Secretary, Sally Jewell. I want to thank the members of Congress who are here who are supporting uh, you know, the outstanding work that not just the Department of Interior is doing, but we're trying to get every agency to really focus on uh, strengthening uh, the nation-to-nation -nation relationship that we have with the tribes. So, Thank you, members of Congress. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody who's here, uh, young and old, but especially the young people uh, who are participating in this, uh, in this terrific forum. You know, when I ran for office, I pledged uh, to build a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship with all of you. And uh, back then, I was just a young, adopted son of the Crow Nation. Didn't have any gray hair. Uh, now I am President Barack Black Eagle. <laughs> and what started out as, as a campaign promise has now become a tradition. Uh, so welcome to the seventh White House Tribal Nations Conference. Uh, now, traditionally, what we've done is I've come out and I've given a big speech. Uh, and I was telling Jude and others, I, I just, I get tired of hearing myself talk, you know, I'm just talking all the time. So instead of a, a, a long speech, uh, I thought I'd have a, a conversation with young people from Indian country. And I just want to start off with a couple of brief thoughts. I, I've often acknowledged the painful history, uh, the broken promises uh, that are part of our past. And I've said that while we couldn't change the past, Working together, nation to nation, we could build a better future. I believe this not only because America has a moral obligation to do right by the tribes uh, and treaty obligations, but because the success of our tribal communities is tied up with the success of America as a whole. And over the past seven years, with tribal leaders and federal uh, officials working together, we've made a lot of progress. Together, we've strengthened your sovereignty. We've expanded opportunity. We've delivered justice, but I think we all understand we've still got more work to do. Uh, we need to do more to safeguard tribal consultation rights across the federal government. We can continue to help to consolidate and restore tribal homelands. We need to create more opportunities for tribal communities. And that's why the budget I sent to Congress this year would have increased our investments in Indian country by $1.5 billion. And we need Congress to show that same support for Indian country. Um, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm so invested in your success is because uh, I've gotten to know so many of you, and we've become friends. And I've visited uh, more Indian country than any sitting president. Um, last year, Michelle and I visited Standing Rock Sioux Nation. Uh, then we invited many of their young people to the White House. Uh, this year I met with young people in the 
uh, Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, in Alaska, I met with Native communities and witnessed how climate change threatens their livelihoods as we speak. And I reiterated my commitment to working with tribal nations to protect your national resources and honor your heritage as we did with Denali. So moving forward, we'll also review tribal proposals to per permanently protect sacred lands for future generations. Uh, while I was in Alaska, by the way, I also had a salmon spawn all over my shoes. <laughs> um, which I was told uh, the salmon was happy to see me. Uh, <laughs> what struck me uh, on each of these trips is when we talk about the future of Indian country, we're really talking about the future of young people. Uh, I don't need to tell you the enormous challenges that they face. Uh, Native children are far more likely to grow up in poverty, suffer from significant health problems, face obstacles in educational opportunity. Uh, a lot of the young people I've met have gone through more than anybody should have to go through in an entire lifetime uh, at a very early age. Uh, losing family members to violence or suicide or addiction and struggling with the kind of poverty that is unacceptable in the richest nation on earth. Um, in these circumstances, sometimes it's hard to dream your way to a better life. Uh, and these challenges didn't just happen randomly uh, to Indian country. The, re the result, the accumulation of systematic discrimination. Uh, but for all our young people have endured, uh, the young people that I've met have also given me incredible hope. I see so much promise in them, so much determination. Uh, in the words of Native American writer Janet Campbell Hale, courage has been bred into you. It is in your blood. Courage is in your blood. Uh, and you're not alone. I want our young people to know that we believe in you. Uh, that's why we started something called Generation Indigenous, which focuses on cultivating the potential of our Native youth. And at least 20 tribal nations have already become my brother's keeper communities to give more young people a shot at success. Even as we prepare our tribal youth to succeed in the 21st century, we also have to preserve and protect Native culture and heritage. Uh, as I've said before, if you start losing your language and your culture, your sense of connection to your ancestors and touchstones that date back generations, uh, you can start feeling adrift. And if you're living in a society that devalues your culture or perpetuates stereotypes, uh, you may be devaluing yourself. So we have to preserve those bonds, break stereotypes. Uh, I believe that includes our sports teams, because we all need to do more to make sure. We need to make sure that our young people feel supported and respected. And that's really what this Tribal Nations Conference is about. Extraordinary young people representing the promise not just of their tribes or of Indian country, but of the United States. Uh, because ultimately, we're one family, and, and these kids are our kids. They deserve to be cared and loved and nurtured uh, and given a shot at uh, opportunity. And if we do the, our part, there's no limit to what they can achieve, because they have extraordinary talent and extraordinary resilience. Uh, I could not be prouder of them. And so with that, I'm going to sit back down and let's start a conversation. Okay. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the final session of the 2015 Tribal Nations Conference. Um, before we get started, I would like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Jude Schimmel. I'm 21 years old and I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Growing up, I had no idea that I would be in the position I am today, but through hard work and the help of my family, I was able to receive a scholarship to the University of Louisville, where I played four years of college basketball and earned my bachelor's degree in sociology. And I'm also a Nike and Seven ambassador and an author. But most importantly, over the past few years, I've had the opportunity to travel and speak to over 60 different um, Native American communities within the United States um, to simply inspire um, young Natives to go out and follow their dreams and do what they love. Um, I truly believe that if we continue to work together that um, we can get to the point where we preserve our, um, our culture and our tradition and also um, allow, allow and create the opportunities that young, young Native Americans deserve. 
Lastly, I would just like to express how honored and how blessed I am to be in front of all of you today and on stage with all these special people. Next, I would like to um, hand it over to our panelists so that they can introduce themselves as well. Shishida, Shishiji, Tatiana, Tiknor, Shlanchi, Dina, Inna, Klinkit, Yupiki, Shlanchi, Da, Dugatnu, Shugu, Shakaya, Halanda, Idi, Shunta, Khutan, Katna, Khaluda. This is me, this is who I am. I am Tatiana Tiknor. I am Dina, Inna, Klinkit, and Yupik, and I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska, and I am 16 years old. Lana get de young yet, Dano, Braden White, Wokskaleoge, Akuzasni Mohawk Nation. My name is Braden White. My traditional name means he carries the bow and arrow on his back. I'm from the Mohawk Nation. I'm 21 and I'm of the Bear Clan. And I would just I would just like to say that, you know, they tried to bury us, but you know what they were burying was the seeds for change and look at we're all blossoming now. My name is Blossom Johnson. I am Navajo and from Black Mesa, Arizona. My name is Philip Douglas. I'm 15 years old. I'm the member of Seminole. I am a member of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. And I am in 10th grade. <laughs> so before we get started, I would just like to clarify and let you guys know that in, um, in addition to the panelists' questions, um, we also have a couple that we got from the online community um, through the hashtag JeniAskedObama. Um, but up first, we have Tatiana. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um. So my question is, uh, is there any way you can get teachers to understand Alaska Native and American Indian students um, more better? And is there a way that we can get rid of or eliminate stereotyping um, and racism within schools? Well, it, it's a great question, Tatiana. And first of all, you know, I, I just really appreciate you guys uh, being here. And we're so proud of you. And I think it's fair to say that when I was their age, I was not making presentations with the president. <laughs> I, I, I just want to point that out. Um, I think it's also important to point out that, that Jude can really ball. Uh, so <laughs> the, uh, she, was, she was being kind of modest and talking about you know, her, her basketball skills. And since I'm a basketball fan, I'm very impressed. <laughs> um, and, and her and her sister, I think, have, have really you know, made uh, all of Indian country so proud. So. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, you, you know, I think that in education, the single most important ingredient is the person in the front of the classroom, the teacher. And we've got incredible, dedicated teachers all across the country. And my sister was a teacher. Uh, my mother taught. Uh, I taught in law school, and, and so uh, I have a deep appreciation for uh, the art of teaching. You know, I think it's one of the most important professions in our society. But part of being a good teacher is being able to connect. Right? Part of being a good teacher is being able to uh, see each individual student and say, how do I motivate them? And how do I uh, relate to them? And how do I make sure that the subject matter that is being taught, whether it's math or science or history or uh, English, that uh, I find a link between what's being studied and what people feel and, and, and uh, what they've gone through in their lives. And, and that's true in any community. But it's especially true, I think, if you've got schools with uh, Native American students or uh, Alaska Natives. Uh, you know, when I was in Alaska, when I was uh, in your home state, it really reminded me a little bit of Hawaii in the sense that you have this incredible indigenous culture, 
that kind of seeps into everything. Uh, but sometimes it's not reflected in the curriculum, and it's not reflected in how uh, the schools are teaching and interacting and what the reading materials are. And, and so uh, I think we have a special obligation to focus on that. And you know, one of the things that we've asked, you know, that I've asked Sally Jewell to do is for those schools that are uh, you know, in the Bureau, uh, under, under Bureau of Indian Affairs jurisdiction, uh, that we revamp the curriculum to get a lot more input from uh, the students and from the Native community and provide more local control so that we are helping to, to shape and assist what's going to work for those students. For schools that are basically state-run or local school districts but have a large Native population, what we're doing is we're giving grants uh, to help those school districts think about these issues uh, in a much more serious way. Um, and, and I guess to your last question, uh, in terms of eliminating uh, racism or stereotypes, uh, that's an obligation of the entire society, but it's especially important in the school. Uh, and so uh, my expectation would be that anybody in authority in a school is being very clear the day, first day kids walk in as to what's acceptable and what's not uh, in terms of how they're interacting with each other, how they're respecting each other, how they're respecting different cultures. If a school's not doing that, it's, it's failing. And you know, one specific element of this that we've, I know, talked about, but I wanna, I wanna give some, some credit uh, right now is, is on this issue of, of uh, schools and mascots. Because if you walk into a school the first day and you're already feeling that stereotypes are embedded in the culture and the cheers and all that, that kid is, is feeling set apart and different. And so I want to give credit to uh, Adidas, uh, and I know a number of their officials are here today. Uh, they've really come up with a smart, creative approach, which is to say, all right, if, if, if we can't get states to, to pass laws to prohibit uh, these mascots, then how can we incentivize schools to think differently? And so what Adidas has done is it said to the 2,000 plus schools that still have uh, you know, Native American or Alaska Native mascots, it said, uh, you know what, we will work with you to redesign your entire sports brand. And, you know, um, I don't know if Adidas made the same uh, offer to a certain NFL team here in Washington, <laughs> um, but they might want to think about that as well. But, but I, I tell you, uh, for Adidas to make that commitment, it's a very smart thing to do because those schools now really don't have an excuse. And what they're saying is one of the, the top sports companies in the world, one of the top brands in the world, is prepared to come in and use all their expertise to come up with something that's really going to work and that the entire community can feel proud of and can bring people together and give a fresh start. And, uh, and I really want to uh, give them a lot of credit for taking that step. Thank you, Tatiana, for your question, and thank you, Mr. President, for your, for your remarks on that subject. Up next, we have Brayden. Hi, Mr. President. Hey, Brayden. Pleasure to meet you. How you doing, man? Good. All right. How, how, is your, how will your administration help tribal education departments empower low-income Native American youth trying to get to college that don't have the money to go to college? Like, how can we... How can they be empowered to have those equal opportunities? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll say to all the young people who are here and all the parents 
uh, of young people who are here. Um, the fact is that a, an education is really the key to uh, a middle class life in the modern world. And there was a time where, as long as you were willing to work hard, you could support a family uh, without a college education. Some sort of advanced schooling beyond high school. It is very hard to do now. You know, every job requires specialization and understanding everything from computers to uh, how to communicate effectively. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a four-year education, a four-year college, but, but you need some advanced training. So the first thing I'd say in terms of uh, uh, Native uh, American and uh, Alaskan youth is we would need to do a better job telling you what's already in place, what's already there. Uh, because the fact of the matter is you know, we expanded Pell Grants to reach millions of more students. Uh, we uh, have tried to simplify something called FAFSA that make sure that uh, it's basically the, the form that you have to fill out to qualify for all the various student loans and, and programs that are out there. It used to be so complicated that a lot of people just wouldn't fill it out, especially if your parents didn't go to college, right? You know, uh, so, so now you may not have enough counselors in the school, you don't know where to go, and you just figure you can't afford it. But the truth of the matter is, is that between Pell Grants and federal loans and grants and scholarships that are available, there's really uh, very few young people who should not be able to go to college if they've got enough motivation. So uh, what we'd like to do is to work with the Department of Education, uh, Department of Interior, local school districts to just spread the word of what's already out there. And we're going to really spend a lot of time on reaching deep into uh, you know, the various uh, you know, communities uh, and, and, and make sure that you are getting that information out to students. Now, the, the other thing that we're trying to do is to strengthen tribal colleges uh, because we think there's an opportunity for more young people to get a really good education in a way that is culturally linked and allows young people sometimes to stay at home. Um, I, you know, I, I remember one of the first times that I saw you and your sister uh, heard about you was there was a story that was done about incredible uh, Native American basketball players who oftentimes had trouble transitioning to college because they weren't used to being away from their tribe and their community. Um, and you know, the, sort of the challenges of being in an environment where you're just cut off from uh, your people and what you know. And I think that tribal colleges can serve as an important bridge. In some cases, it may be you start in that college and then you transfer to a larger university once you've kind of uh, gotten more familiar and comfortable with uh, what's required. Um, so we're going to also work a lot uh, on that issue. Huh. All right, the next question we got from online, but it may be a little similar to what you just answered. Okay. The question is, how can we best encourage our Native youth to pursue an education and integrate while still maintaining our culture, traditions, and languages? You know, this since I've been talking about education twice, this may be one of those where I turn it to you guys and, and see what you guys think. Um, uh, anybody want to volunteer some thoughts in terms of something I should know uh, that you think would be especially helpful? Go ahead, Tatia. Um, so at my school, we, since it's um, Native Heritage Month, we're actually doing a word of the day on the morning announcements every day. So I think um, all the other schools should do that as well because it raises awareness for your uh, culture and language, and it will teach non-Native students language as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Blossom, you got any um, thoughts on that? Well, for the education part where students can't pay for it or are having trouble paying for it, because I've noticed that some after-school programs can probably provide more information about scholarships, fellowships, and maybe even grants to go to college. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. 
if we don't have enough counselors in the schools, mm -hmm. then having tribal organizations, non-for-profit organizations kind of fill some of those gaps. Uh, I think uh, that's really important. She pretty much touched on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My man's kind of low key over here. He's just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, 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 let, let, me, let me say one thing, though, and, and I'd be interested, you know, anybody who has an opinion on this. Um, and I know when I went to Standing Rock, I, I was talking to some of the young people about that. Um, you know, part of, part of it, the challenge here for young people, I think this is true for all young people, but especially true sometimes for uh, African-American or Latino or, or uh, Asian-American and, and Native Americans as well, is this age-old question in America, like how do you stay true to your roots and your culture, but also how are you part of the larger community? How do you balance that out? And uh, I, I think the one thing that I would say, and there's some communities that have done this better than others, is to recognize that um, in order for young people to be successful today, you're not cut off from the rest of the world. You have to compete. You know, you have to have knowledge which will empower you about how the world works. And it's not a betrayal of your traditions to understand those tools and use them on behalf of your community and on behalf of yourself. Uh, now, I think what you also then have to do is to be in touch with, though, where you're coming from and not forget that. But that's not always going to be in the environment that you find yourself in. And you can't shy away from breaking out of what you know and, and going ahead and, and, and reaching out and, and striving in environments that are unfamiliar to you, kind of breaking out of your comfort zone. Uh, as long as you know that you still have home base there with you. And I think that sometimes people get into a situation where they think, oh, you know, if, I, if I'm going to college and I'm learning this or that or the other, then, and a bunch of my friends are still back home and they're not doing the same thing, then somehow I'm not authentic, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, really true to my culture and so forth. And that, I don't think, is productive thinking. Uh, that, that, I think, we, we have to get rid of. Because, you know, if you, you were just talking about languages, if you learn Spanish, that doesn't mean you're not an English speaker. It just means that you've got one more thing that you know that you can use and you can translate. Uh, if, if you, uh, you know, learn engineering, that doesn't mean you have to forget uh, you know, traditional ways of your people. It just means you've got both, right? You can hunt and you can fish and you can, you know, you've got you, uh, you, you know, your, your native beliefs, but you can also build a bridge and write code and, and that's fine. So, so I, I say all that just because on the one hand it's important, I think, for native youth to, to, to be supported, connected, and have a place where they're learning who they are and where they come from. But that can't be like a crutch or an excuse to be uh, avoiding what's you know, outside the tribe. Um, because you know, cultures have to adapt and they have to grow alongside the world. And, and, and there are communities that do this really well. Um, you, know, you think about the Jewish community in America who very successful in all, all fields, but also deeply rooted oftentimes in their faith. 
you know, I think that there, there are a number of Asian American communities there where, uh, you know, there's school and then there's a whole uh, set of institutions that teach them their native languages and or, or uh, you know, the languages of, of their, their homeland. And, and they don't see a contradiction in it. And I think we have to, uh, you know, we have to uh, think about this the same way. And as I said, it's, this is not unique to Native Americans. I, you see this sometimes in the African American community. Michelle, you know, came, came out of a working class neighborhood. A lot of her friends didn't go to college. And sometimes when she came back from college, people would be like, oh, you, y'all, all all that, aren't you? You know? <laughs> and she's all, no, I'm just, I'm going to college, you know, that, that doesn't make me less black or, you know, that, that, you know I'm, I'm a black woman who went to college. And that's, that's I think, how we, I want our young people to think. You can do both. Thank you again, Mr. President. <laughs> Up next is Blossom with her question. OK, well, first of all, I just want to thank you for creating the Obama Scholars Program at ASU, because I am an Obama Scholar. There you go. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> okay, so I really want to speak about poverty, because I currently live on the Navajo Reservation. Well, right now I'm in school, but I live on the reservation, too. When I go home, I don't really have a suitable home, and I don't have running water or electricity. So I understand that you went to visit the Standing Rock Sioux Nation, and I know I've, I've seen pictures of the reservation. So, OK, um, I want to know what kind of programs you have to offer Native American communities who have the worst housing and living conditions. Well, uh, you know, a lot of this uh, is run through, traditionally has been run through the Bureau. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, you know, for decades, um, it was underfunded. Mm. It was oftentimes not well managed. It was kind of an afterthought, afterthought. And part of the reason why, when I came in, we started this conference was to make sure that we had a direct nation to nation relationship with all the different tribes. And our first thing was to just listen to people and, and find out what is it that you need? What are you trying to do? What are the opportunities that you have? And then we'll try to design ways to help based on what it is that you think uh, would make the biggest difference. Because you know, obviously not every tribe's the same. I mean, there are, there are now tribes that are doing really well because of you know, gaming or because of you know, the natural resources that they've been able to harness, uh, have development ideas that they're moving for, uh, forward on. Uh, and then there are other uh, communities that are having a tougher time. So the first thing is for us to listen to each tribe and find out, okay, what can we do? On almost every measure, whether it's housing, education, uh, economic development, healthcare, we've been trying to boost resources that are available. And, uh, and that's really important, so we're really focused on uh, uh, you know, how do we build up the infrastructure in, uh, in, in reservations that are having a tough time. It's not acceptable that anybody doesn't have running water in this country, right? So, so, so that's just a straightforward matter of help, getting the help from Congress to help uh, build out the infrastructure that people need. But one of the things that I've learned in conversations with a lot of the you know, presidents and, and governors and others who are uh, in the audience is we have to think about sustainable development. So the idea is not just that the tribe is getting money from the federal government. The question is, how do we give tribes the tools whereby they can start generating jobs and economic development and progress on their own terms within their communities? And, and I think that is where we have to really focus. Uh, I was just talking to uh, one gentleman 
because we took photos before we came out, who, who said you know, they had just signed a contract for a multi-million dollar clean energy facility, right? And you know, that suddenly brings resources to the community, it creates jobs, and now that's an economic engine that you, know, you can start selling power to surrounding communities using in a sustainable way uh, the resources of that tribe, um, and then take that money and plow it back in to you know, create more businesses and more jobs. Uh, and, and that, I think, is something that we really want to spend time on and focus on. But the first thing is just getting some running water. And that requires just an investment. Uh, and that's something that we budgeted. We're aware of it. Uh, it's, yeah. Congress doesn't always cooperate with me. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you for the question, Ms. Watson. Up next, we have Philip. Oh. <clears throat> uh, Mr. President, my question is, do you have any ideas or programs that could prevent childhood obesity and diabetes for Native youth? Absolutely. Uh, it, you know, the, uh, I, uh, uh, because I live with Michelle Obama. <laughs> and, She's all about this. Uh, you know, when we had the Generation Indigenous uh, uh, and, and Youth Summit, uh, how long ago was that, Sally? A couple months ago? It was in July. Um, I know she talked about this. Uh, look, th th this is a problem for the entire country. It's now actually a global problem. And part of what's happened is that uh, as our culture has changed, our kids are eating foods that in, uh, create uh, obesity. They're not getting the same kind of exercise that they did uh, a generation ago. And you, know, you combine those, those two things and uh, we are seeing this explosion of childhood obesity. Now, since Michelle started Let's Move and My Plate and all these other programs, we've actually seen some progress in some areas, but it's still something where we've got to make a lot more progress because uh, when, when kids start off unhealthy and obese early on, uh, the likelihood of them having severe health problems later in life uh, are much, much higher. And that means much higher health care expenses for the society as a whole, which means we then have less money for things like setting up you know, clean water systems uh, and investing in education and college scholarships. So, so this is something we can turn around. It starts with young people uh, just uh, having ways in which they can, on a regular basis, get exercise and get healthy meals. And so. What we're going to try to do is to work with all the tribes and the schools and make a determination, uh, okay, based on traditions and cultures and your budgets, you know, how do we get more creative about creating you know, meal plans and, that, are, uh, that are better for our kids? And how do we program in uh, exercise and, and uh, that, that you know, is going to keep them healthy. Uh, but I don't know. Right, let, let's ask the hotshot Division I <laughs> athlete. <laughs> what, uh, Jude, what, what, what ideas do you have in terms of making sure that, because what is true is, is that uh, the, the incidence of uh, obesity among Native American youth is higher uh, than it is for the general population. Some of that is just poor children are more likely to be obese. Um, because they, they're, they're eating, you know, different stuff. And, uh, and so it sometimes it's more challenging. In some Native communities, it's hard to find healthy food. Uh, you know, there are a lot of what's called food deserts where, you know, it's easy to buy a bag of chips, but it's harder to get, you know, uh, some fresh fruit or something. So I don't know. What, uh, what do you think? 
I would agree that it definitely starts with um, with the youth. I know, and you said it kind of like it was the last generation. Um, I guess that's kind of mine, but I remember being outside, playing outside, doing sports 24-7, and that's obviously changed, especially with the technology these days. Um, but I also know that living in a rural place, um, like you said, it's very hard to find you know, nutritious food and things like that. So I guess this is another question for you, but I'm wondering how can we make it to where the food that is available isn't necessarily fast food and it's more, you know, it's healthier for... Right. Well, one, one, of the, one of the interesting uh, things that we're trying to do is to, to link up local economies with school systems and, so that farmers and you know, uh, you know, this, this whole movement of, of uh, farm to fork or whatever you want to call it, the basic idea is right now most school districts and a lot of rural communities, even though there's food all around, people aren't growing it there anymore. If they do grow it, they ship it to somewhere else. It gets processed, manufactured, you know, stuffed with a whole bunch of stuff that's not necessarily bad for you. It gets frozen, <laughs> gets shipped back, and you know, the question is, and this is going to be different for each community, are there ways to link up with local farmers? Are there ways to link up with, uh, you know, traditional uh, food sources? You know, when I was in Alaska, uh, you know, we went to Dillingham on, on Bristol Bay. Uh, that's where the salmon did, the, did his thing on my shoe. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, in, in, in Alaska, uh, na uh, Alaska Natives get 50% of their calories from traditional sources. You know, hunting, fishing, you know, uh, gathering. And, you know, that's an example of where, how, how do we adapt that so that that becomes part of the food chain for kids when they're in school, right? Because if, if, if there's all this salmon out in the ocean, uh, you know, then, which is really good for you, but then you go to school and all you got is tater tots. Now, nothing wrong with tater tots. I don't want anybody <laughs> to. <laughs> but you get my point. You know, uh, or you got some frozen pizza that got shipped in when you could be eating this incredible salmon that was fresh caught and is going to be good for you. And by the way, that then gives the fishermen a market so they're now making more money. Right? Those are the kinds of opportunities. I think that we've got to we, we've got to look to, and in, in local school districts, in fairness to local school districts, sometimes it's easier for them to take the processed food. And one of the problems that's happened in the way schools are organized these days is recess is so short, and lunch breaks are so short that the easiest thing to do is to kind of just defrost something or stick something in the microwave, plop it on a tray, because you only got you know, half an hour before you, we send you to your next class. And this goes back to the education point you guys were making earlier. One of the things that we should be trying to do is, is to think of the whole child. You know, education is not just books. You know, education is... Uh, you know, physical fitness. Education is the arts. Education is music and, and dance and movement and learning how to eat right. And you know, if, if we have schools that are, that are not designed to do all those things and take care of the whole child, then uh, we're probably making a mistake. I have kind of something up to follow up with that, but um, as you know, all aspects of life connect, but I'm just wondering, um, since um, 
financial situations are typically an issue among Native American families. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, how we can get the decrease the unemployment rates and increase, um, you know, to get more um, better financial situations. Because not only is McDonald's fast, but it's also cheap. So, um, you know, if we have better financial situations, we would have better opportunity to eat healthier. And you know, yeah. Well, as I said before, I mean, I think that we're working with tribes to to come up with economic development strategies. I think it's very important for us to have a, you know, in our nation to nation relationships, to have a strategic plan. Uh, it, it's not just a matter of each year, let's get a little more on the budget to you know, give to Indian Health Services or this or that or the other, because that's important. But the goal here is how do we create sustainable development for the nations. And you know, whether it's through clean energy projects, whether it's through uh, tourism and you know, that's controlled, but you know, the, the tribes benefit from it, uh, whether it's uh, you know, utilization of, of native lands, whether it's uh, you know, starting incubators for small businesses on the reservation. You know, all those things have to be stitched together. So if we're building a road in Navajo country, you know, let's make sure that that road connects to a hub that makes it easier for Navajo to engage in commerce with the local community. Right? Uh, if there are things that uh, the tribes are purchasing from the outside. Is there a way to start a business where it's produced on the inside? Because if, if, if the tribe's spending money, you know, it's, it'd be useful to, to find areas where potentially you could, uh, a, a young person like you starts a business and suddenly you're producing the pencils or the lunches or what have you. Uh, and then that money gets recirculated, and th that increases incomes uh, for everybody. Um, but as I said, I, I think when, when you look now at communities that are most successful, nothing is more important than young people and talent and education. The way, the, the most important way that uh, Indian country is gonna improve its economic prospects is to make sure every young person has the skills and talent they need to succeed. And in some cases, that's gonna be because they come back to a reservation and start a business, or they're managing a non-for-profit or uh, a tribal development organization. In some cases, it's gonna be, yes, they, they leave the reservation and they're working, they're succeeding, they're making money, and now you know, they're finding ways to reconnect with their Community and we sh and and both things are legitimate, right? You know, the, 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 there's nothing wrong. If anybody here on this panel, you know, Blossom, if after you graduate, you decide, I want to be a, a, you know, business person, and you know, uh, you're successful. You know, I have confidence that you're going to stay connected to. Navajo country, and, and you're going to then be able to give back. Uh, and, and, and you're going to open up opportunities for cousins and brothers, and you know, not just by way of example, but because you're part of that community, part of that tribe. And, and that is going to be part of how we also grow the economy. So young people investing in education and really being focused uh, on uh, being able to compete in, in the larger economy, that's really important as well. So. Our next question is, um, we got it from online also. It is, what measures are you and your team taking to ensure the next administration pays attention to Native voices? Well, I got to admit I'm biased here. I'm really trying to make sure it's a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, that's I know, you know, there's some... You know, there's, there, there, there's some Republican members of Congress uh, who, you know, represent Native communities and, and uh, are really 
some of these issues like Tom Cole and uh, you know, Oklahoma. And, and so I don't want to sound too partisan. Um, I mean, part of what we've done is, you know, we've, we've tried to institutionalize just new practices. And my expectation is whoever's the next president, they're going to see that we've been able to build, I think, some real trust with, uh, you know, tribal nations. And, and, and if they're smart, they'll, they'll want to continue what we've done because I think we're really making progress. Uh, and. And the good news is, is that the, the tribes now know what's possible so they can hold accountable the next administration and say, hey, you know, we're meeting with Obama and, and his team once a year, and they were going out and visiting us and doing all kinds of things, and we haven't seen you, right? And, and, and I think that, you know, that, that, can, uh, that can make a difference. Um, but. I do think it's important for the next president to be able to articulate very clearly how they're going to interact. You know, one thing I'm proud of, because a lot of you I knew before I was president, I made a commitment. I made a promise about what I would do, and I've done it. And, uh, but it starts with, as you're listening to various candidates, making sure that uh, you ask them now before you offer them support, and that's true whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. Okay, here's what we've been able to build over the last seven years. Are you committed to continuing it? Uh, and, and if they say yes, then now you've got something you know, that uh, you can hold them accountable to. Since we have more time, Blossom, would you like to um, answer, ask your second question? Oh, yes. Um, well, I, I just wanted to let you know that I um, lost four friends to suicide since middle school, and I want to know how your administration can support health and mental wellness of Native youth and our veterans. Well, you know, the, the, they're, they're two different uh, groups, mm -hmm. right? Veterans have some very specific needs. Uh, and through the VA, we are really focusing on this. And in the Department of Defense, when people are still in uniform, we're focused on this. Uh, letting people know that it's not a weakness, it's a strength for you to seek out help when uh, you are suffering from severe depression or other uh, you know, challenges like that. Um, with respect to young people, you know, I'd be interested, this is one where I think I'd really like to hear from all of you, uh, because this is, this is a story I hear too often. When I was at Standing Rock, I mean, it was just, the number of stories that I heard was heartbreaking. Um, and uh, you know, we, we can provide more resources, and we are doing so. I've, I've asked Sally and others to really focus on how do we uh, prevent suicide, addiction, uh, you know, provide more mental health services and counseling? Um, but I think uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys, you know, who are, you know, in it, um, what you think would make the biggest difference, what you think would be most helpful. So I don't know about, since you asked it, boss, why don't you? Why don't you <laughs> Well, I feel like it's very taboo to speak about it in Native American communities, especially the older adults might think that it is. But I feel like the youth are really ready to speak about it, and I feel like there should be a little bit more support in the school system, because some of the schools I've actually got to work with on the reservation, they don't really have after-school programs. They have, like, they're very, they're like really strict on education, but there's really nothing that can connect you to your culture after school or teach you some of your traditions after school, but I feel like some of these are very important to youth and I know there might be some kind of like cultural identity or identity loss and some of them might be confused and it feel like there's no help. So the only situation, the only like, um, 
logical explanation and they, that they might have or they might think is maybe suicide. Yeah. And for me, I want to, I guess, prevent suicide. And I'm a theater, so I do theater. I love theater. And I try to do a lot of that in my work and how I try to understand why these youth think the only answer is suicide. It could be something at home like abuse, child abuse, or just like their parents might be like alcoholics or something, but no one really speaks to these kids. Mm -hmm. well, anybody else want to offer some thoughts? Well, I think um, talking about suicide is very crucial. It should be talked about. We should knock down the stigma of talking about like your problems. A lot of people look at it as it's a sign of weakness, and it isn't. It's actually, like you stated, a, a sign of strength. I, I lost a friend, a very good friend. He was a uh, he was at prep school and he came home and he committed suicide. And like I never, we you know we constantly search for the answers, but like the answer usually is that there's it's that stigma. Like you don't want to be a look be looked at as a weak person. Mm -hmm. And I think you know we need to knock down that barrier and you know have it be known that talking about it isn't a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any thoughts on this? Uh, I do. So I'd like to shout out my friend Jasmine over here because she did the Warrior Circle project. And hey, Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, uh, what's, what's the Warrior Circle project? Well, as she explains it, she helps um, children that uh, think about suicide and also have problems within schools, right? Um, and she talks about them because people can actually connect to youth more, like youth to youth instead of youth to adult. Um, so I just thought that was a good uh, project to bring up because I work with her. Like, yeah, absolutely. Of. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> do you have any thoughts on this? Um, through my experience of traveling and speaking and you know seeing a lot of Native Americans across the country, I've also come to realize that um, you know, and growing up and living on a reservation, I've realized that young Native Americans do struggle with, um, you know, um, whether it's emotional or mental or physical abuse. Um, I know that it can be frustrating being a young Native American and, um, you know, in a society that you feel like you really are the minority and things like that. But I just feel like we, as Native people, need a, need a resource or need an outlet. And a lot of the times I feel like young Native Americans are scared to speak about it. Um, you know, whether it's because they feel like they're weak or because, um, you know, whatever the reason might be. But I know it's easier said than done, but there is, we need to get through to them to let them know that, you know, that really isn't the answer and that they're, you know, you need to find somebody to talk to. But, um, you know, how do we get that through to them? Right. Well, one of the things, you know, uh, I, I talked about Generation Indigenous. The, the goal is to get uh, Native American youth leaders to be able to network with each other nationally. And then we're trying to set up a youth network digitally, right, through the internet, so that you know, if there's a, a good idea like the one that uh, Tatiana was, was, was just talking about, a program that we know is working, then somebody across the country can learn about it and try to set up a similar model uh, and, and you know, share ideas. And I think one of the things that I'm hearing a lot of you guys saying is, is that uh, making sure that young people are supporting each other is really important. Uh, because because you know, adults have to be there. But I, I will tell you from my experience talking to Malia and Sasha that sometimes when I'm talking to them, uh, I sound like, uh, you know, you guys uh, see, ever see a Charlie Brown Christmas. Yeah, it's, it's like wah, 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 wah. <laughs> yeah, you can just tell they're just looking at me, but the words like make no sense to them. Um, and, and but I think that how their peers are supporting them and talking to them and encouraging them a lot of times can make even more of a difference than what they're hearing from adults. Now, obviously, if somebody's got a severe depression, you know that's a medical issue, and they may need medical help. Uh, and, you know, if, if somebody, even at a young age, is already uh, has an addiction, uh, they need help. If, if they are experiencing abuse in the home, then 
you know, they need adult help and law enforcement help to prevent that, right? Um, and you're right, it has to be talked about, and, and we have to be honest about it. But sometimes with young people, uh, you know, everything is magnified, and you know, you're just going through a lot of stuff, especially in the teenage years. And just having friends and people your age who are bucking you up and supporting you and listening to you and relating to what you're going through, that a lot of times can make a difference uh, before it gets worse, right? So, uh, so we're gonna see how we can help facilitate more of those youth communities uh, around the country. And just to add on to what you were saying about, like when I was in high school as a senior, we had a program and it was called Sources of Strength. And that's what it was. It was a student to student peer. You know, if you were getting bullied, if you were, there was problems at home, you could speak about it. And because right. there, there's, there's that barrier, like it's hard for a student to speak to a teacher about it. But for a you know, student to, to talk to another student, it was more easier. And it was a lot of the students were able to relate to it because they might have experienced it in their life at some point. Right. So, I mean, that seemed to work very well. Good. Um, that concludes our question and answer session. I would just like, like to thank you, Mr. President, and each of our panelists for being up here with us today. Okay, let's give everybody a big round of applause. <laughs> All right. Good job. Yes, closing remarks. Yeah, it's all you. <laughs> the, uh, so, I do just said I'm supposed to make closing remarks. Uh, and the only, thing I, the only thing I want to say in closing is just, you know, this is an example of the incredible talent and potential uh, of you know, our young people. And it's true uh, in every tribe across the country. We have a huge stake as a country in making sure that they get opportunity, that their voices are heard. And uh, I want to be a partner with you to make sure that every possible door is open to them, okay? And, and uh, uh, they inspire me, you, ins you guys inspire me. You make me feel good. Thank you, everybody. Come on, let's get a good picture, come on. Come on, we're gonna stand right here and these guys are gonna take this picture right here.